Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another special edition of the show. So I drove four and a half hours to Albuquerque to go hang out with this guy. Um, so I'm out at uh, Grue, and um, this has been an uh, amazing experience. Uh, this is the first time I've been able to see up close how a method champenois sparkling, or just any sparkling wine, but basically, you know, traditional method has been made. Um, the last, I, I was telling uh, Michael and... Uh, uh, Brittany, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The she's the wine club manager. Wine club manager. Yeah. yeah. So earlier today, I got to taste a bunch of stuff. Um, I was telling them the closest I got was Vuv on Ball, but it was like from a catwalk, you know, like forty feet, in, well, twenty or thirty feet in the air. So I didn't get to see all the stuff up close. So um, anyway, so I'm excited to be here. We just finished a tour of how sparkling wine is made, which is pretty intense compared to regular wine. And uh, Michael, before I talk for another like 20 more minutes about it uh mike why don't you introduce yourself um and kind of tell us how you got here or into wine and then we'll go from there sure all right well thank you mark i really appreciate this opportunity um name's michael dominguez um really have two careers my first career was in the military mm -hmm. i was in the air force for 11 years active duty um ended up being in uh california around 2007 to 2009. And uh, my wife and I uh, were living in Oakland and we took a lot of trips up to Napa and Sonoma, even as far north as Mendocino, mm -hmm. and really enjoyed wine. Um, we're foodies yeah. and we love wine. And uh, my wife's an amazing cook and uh, we wanted to be close to family. So her family's here in Albuquerque. All right. And so we decided to make the jump and we moved here to Albuquerque in December 2009 and uh, was looking for a career change. And um, uh, there was an opportunity here at Gruet Winery, started in the tasting room doing sales there in 2010, part time. I did some reserve time still in the Air Force and uh, started here full time January 2012 doing compliance eventually production and mm -hmm. now I'm the director of operations here at Crue. Yeah. So um, it's been for me a fantastic experience because I love I love learning mm -hmm. uh, and um, I uh, have had the opportunity to learn from what I think is one of the best winemakers here in the United States probably easily in my mind and I know I'm biased the best for making uh, sparkling wine traditional method and that's Laurent Gruet yeah. he's been here for this is our 30th anniversary here at Gruet Winery and uh, it's been an amazing experience and uh, a lot of what I've learned comes directly from Laurent from the tour yeah and being able to help grow the winery uh, to where we're at today is has been a, a great eight-year plus journey um, and uh, really exciting. Yeah, very nice. Um, and one of the things about coming out and visiting wineries um, and, and, um, is that, well, actually I found out more recently, but um, finding out how to pronounce the names of the wineries. So for several years, I've been calling it Gruet because I didn't know. And then actually uh, somebody in distribution, like the, somebody who actually distributes it, I said, well, how's it pronounced? And sometimes even distributor, even sometimes reps don't know right. because they just make assumptions. But it is Gruet. Yeah. Um, just like for those of you that think it's Moet, it's actually Moet because it's a, it's actually not even a French word. It's like, it's like a Dutch word or something like that. Right. But so, yeah, it's Gruet. Um, so now that we've covered that and now we know it's a French word and French pronunciation, <laughs> um, there's definitely a French connection. Uh, right. And I didn't mean to make a pun or anything. I just realized I just reference the movie um so when we kind of go through the history of how they came how the the family came over here and what what where they were looking at and decided on albuquerque of all places absolutely yeah. so i've um been really fortunate um having uh worked with laurent 
for the past eight years. Um, uh, the family actually started uh, in Champagne in a small co- small town called Beton, mm-hmm. um, and they started a, a co-op there in 1952. Um, so Laurent's dad, Gilbert Gruet, is the founder of um, not only Gruet Fils, which is the name of the co-op in Beton, uh, but also of a rather large Champagne house now called Paul Laurent. That's mm-hmm. their that's their brand. They do about three million bottles of champagne. Yeah, and uh, Gilbert, our our founder, was a visionary, and he wanted to bring sparkling wine to the United States. That was happening a lot in the late seventies, early eighties, mm-hmm. um, because you had Moet Chandon mm-hmm. establishing Chandon, you had Frisinet establishing Gloria Ferrer. Mm-hmm. Um, Gilbert originally looked at California, um, pretty expensive. Thin, like it is now. Yeah. Um, and what a lot of people don't know, and it's pretty exciting to share because I'm also one of the board members for New Mexico Wine Growers, um, is that New Mexico has a long history of growing grapes. Um, so our history goes um, as far back as 1629 uh, when the Spanish missionaries came up from Mexico and they needed, um, they needed wine, so they planted grapes, um, mission grape. Mm-hmm. Uh, for sacramental wine. Um, so um, Gilbert uh, got hooked up with some French and German grape growers actually here in New Mexico, and they planted their first vineyard in Lordsburg, which is in the southwestern portion of the state. Okay. Um, and that happened in 1984. So just like any type of farming situation, you need labor, right? Yeah. So he looked at his kids. Uh, so uh, Gilbert and his wife, uh, Danielle, had four children. Um, the oldest are twins. Their names are Jacqueline and Isabel. Uh, and then Natalie uh, Gruet and then Laurent Gruet, okay. um, who started making champagne in Baton uh, when he was 16 years old. So uh, Gilbert decided to send out uh, Natalie when she was 21, I think, and Laurent when he was 19. Mm-hmm. Um, to New Mexico. They spoke no English uh, and uh, they were really in the middle of nowhere and they planted the first vines there in Lordsburg. Um, so first harvest was in 1987, you know, uh, takes three years mm-hmm. to get some fruit. And then uh, the first release of sparkling wine were actually our Grey Brut, Grey Blanc de Noir, over 2,000 cases. Uh, and that was in 1989. Okay. And uh, and that's basically um, an amazing for me um, as a businessman and and as a person who runs the winery here from the operations side. It's a real amazing story how how they built so much, um, but starting you know so so small. Yeah. And uh, um, so yeah, we've been making sparkling wine here since 1989 so sparkling wine in in the desert in the desert yeah i mean you've been to champagne many times i mean i'm sure champ you know champagne isn't is it not this an, an arid place but it exactly. can look kind of barren yeah from what i've seen pictures no of. it's yeah. it's it's very barren yeah. uh and um having been to champagne there's there's it's wet and champagne yeah. and it's very very dry here um uh, Laurent likes to say that uh, um, we do what we do have going for us in this state um, is uh, the vineyards where we source from. Um, it's very uh, it's a it's a higher elevation between mm-hmm. four to five thousand feet, um, so you get those really hot days and those cool nights. So it gives um, uh, adds a little bit of structure uh, to to the vines um, and. Uh, an advantage as well as since there is not as much moisture. I mean, obviously we, we drip irrigate because you need water. Yeah. Um, we don't get a lot of mold issue. We don't get really as much as pest issues yeah. as you as you would think. And uh, the soil for the most part is a sandy loam soil. So it forces the, the vines um, are primarily uh, plants that we use are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, it forces uh, those vines to dig deep uh, and it develops to kind of like that kind of real nice, bright minerality that you really want in, in sparkling wine. Yeah. And we, we shoot to yield between 
for hopefully five to ten tons per acre, um, okay. and which is very different than making uh, um, growing uh, grapes for for still wine, because mm -hmm. um, we need higher yields because we want that um, l low sugar but bright acidity. Yeah, and we're looking at that really nice bright juice. Yeah, and not as much of the rich tannin structures that you would get in a typical still wine. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I was talking with Brittany earlier. Uh, we were kind of talking about the vineyards. Um, so as far as the New Mexico vineyards, most of them are in the south, but there are some near here. Or is that, is that Yeah, correct? that's a great question. Yeah. So we source a lot from, uh, um, from Deming, which is southern New Mexico, mm -hmm. um, uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Uh, and then uh, we also source from uh, a vineyard uh, that is outside truth or consequences mm -hmm. chardonnay pinot noir as well a little bit of chenin blanc which yeah. you which you tried i tried that yeah, yeah yeah and so um and then our partnership that we're really excited about is with the santa ana pueblo which is nine miles north of here okay um and, and that's uh, what i see above your shoulder right uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> we have our detailed uh, vineyard map, which shows all the different clones. Yeah. And that has, has been a really fun and amazing project. Uh, the Santa Ana Pueblo approached uh, the Gouet family, I think in 2013, okay. about uh, uh, planting grapes and, and Gouet purchasing them on a, doing like a long-term partnership. And it's been really fun. Um, yeah. I've got to work firsthand uh, with the governors, um, they rotate every year with the director of agriculture there as well and the vineyard manager. And just yeah. to be able to see from the stakes being put down and the vines, uh, the plants uh, being planted, um, we have 30 acres there. Um, and it's mostly Pinot Noir mm -hmm. that we use for our sparkling programs and a little bit for our still rosé program. Okay. Um, a uh, little bit of Chardonnay. And what Laurent, our winemaker, is really excited about is a uh, Pinot Meunier, which, as you all know, is the classic blending grape right, yeah. in Champagne, which we've never had a Pinot Meunier, as far as I know, for sparkling in the state of New Mexico. And uh, what's really exciting is in celebration of our 30th anniversary, we are going to release uh, Pinot Meunier only sparkling wine this fall. Yeah. And it's been tasting awesome. Right. Uh, Laurent's constantly trying the wines, obviously, to see how they're progressing while they're on tourage. And it's a, it's a really special wine. But yeah. uh, so it's been a really good producer. We've had, this will be our fourth harvest, I think, uh, this, this coming year, 2019 harvest. Okay. And it's been a really fun partnership. Laurent loves it because he could go down to nine miles, he could prune, you know, I've always I don't know who said it, so I don't know who to attribute to, but I've heard uh, the saying that the um, uh, uh, the best like growth opportunity of the vines is when it's under um, the winemaker shadow, you okay. know, to like have that winemaker interaction uh, with with the vineyard is is really cool to okay. have that nearby. Yeah, yeah, yeah and um, I mean, you you have a. A fairly large production so you do have to source outside of New Mexico exactly um, and so you have some great partners in what California exactly and yeah. uh, well so, well you make a lot of wine so right. you have like you know with the sparkling and the still you have some California some Oregon and some uh, Washington uh, correct Columbia Valley Walla Walla yeah uh, yeah mostly actually out of uh, um, most, most a lot of our Washington fruit comes out of, of Prosser, mm -hmm. uh, as well as Walla Walla. Yeah. And, um, uh, and then California, as you mentioned, and a little bit, not a lot, out of Oregon as yeah. well. Um, so um, Laurent really likes that because, you know, as a blending house to make the best sparkling wine, we're getting the best sparkling fruit from all these different great regions in the United States. Right. Um, and... Uh, uh, but you're right. It is big production. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, even say, you know, just the kind of in Champagne, this is what they do. Exactly. Most, most Champagne houses right. don't own significant portions of their own vineyards. Right. Some do, right. but you know, even the big houses there, you mm -hmm. know, um, which I know produce more than you do, but right. you know, even, even the really big houses, I mean, they, they have to source it and they're looking for great, great grapes. And that's really exactly. bottom line. You need great product yeah to, we need great grapes great sources to make you know a really great wine oh it's absolutely yeah. true i mean you can uh 
Um, you can make great wines if you have really good fruit, but it's nearly impossible. I would say it is impossible to make great wines out of bad fruit. Yes. So. Yeah, you, you, you said, but if <laughs> you didn't say it, I was going to say that. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, so as we kind of got on the subject of the, of the, of the still wines, and that's um, some of the stuff I, I tasted already. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a, I had a Chenin Blanc. Um, I had the I had a Pinot Noir, which uh, I think a decent amount of that does come from Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so when when Brittany poured that for me and I tasted it, um, I, you know, I was like, man, this really tastes kind of like an Oregon Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of asked her, where do you source the fruit? And she <laughs> goes, most of it from Oregon. I was like, cool, because it tastes like Oregon. So, right. um, so that was really nice. Um, and, and then I had, um, I think I had also the, I think I also had the, uh, there's a Pinot Noir Rosé, right? Yeah. I had that, and then I thought I had something else. Oh, I had the uh, had the red blend. Oh, you did? Yeah. And right. these are all, like, winery-only things. Like, this is not something where... Exactly. Most of them are sold just in our tasting rooms here yeah. in Albuquerque and in Santa Fe. Right, yeah. yeah. The Chenin Blanc, uh, the, the Still Rosé, we do a little bit of wholesale of. The Pinot Noir, a little bit of wholesale mm -hmm. of. Um, but the the... The Chenin Blanc definitely in our tasting room. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's New Mexico fruit, right? That's a hundred percent New yeah. Mexico fruit. That was really yeah. nice. Yeah. So when we get done, remind me because I'm going to get some of these wines. So it's like one, they were good, and two, I can't get them in Texas or even outside right. of the you know tasting room. So I definitely yeah. want to go home with some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, so they do make some. They, uh, you guys make some um, still wine, and actually that was actually the first. Part of the production we saw too wasn't it that's right so yeah, yeah. so tell me about that because that's really cool that you the, the links that, that you go through to do this yes okay yeah so um what we're doing today and i told uh mark he came had perfect timing because we're actually yeah. running all of our production lines uh so we have a mobile bottling line that we use that we own um we use it about two to three times a year because really our we're a bubbly house we do sparkling wine traditional method mm -hmm. but we do do as mark mentioned some small still wine production and so right now we are mark got to see it and take some video we're doing our our that's, our, that's my cue yeah <laughs> <laughs> do, our, do our our chardonnay run we're doing about 2200 cases of of chardonnay and um it's it's a process because we're again focused primarily on sparkling so it's it's outside you know we have to make sure that the temperature of the wine is good um and there's there's always some challenges when you use kind of like a mobile bottling uh, line, but we've done it enough times where we have it dialed down pretty well, mm -hmm. and it's it's great because in about eight production days we'll we'll um, we'll bottle approximately um, fifty three hundred cases of of different still wines. Yeah, and so uh, so yeah, I yeah, think I have so, some Chardonnay you should try too. After okay, yeah, we'll do that. What we just bottled. Yeah, if oh, you'd like be, to. Oh, that'd be outstanding. Yeah. If you just bottled. Yeah, so when we get done, we'll. We'll taste that. Um, so, and so you got Hugo, yes, right. Yes. So, can I explain? You got a special crew. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, we uh, merged with a company called Precept Wines. They're based out of Seattle in 2000, the summer of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thanks to them, they've been able to get us some resources to help us grow. Uh, one of those is not only the mobile bottling line, but St. Chappelle Winery in Idaho is a part of Precept Wines. It's one of their brands, one of their wineries. And Hugo is awesome. He's their production manager there at St. Chappelle, and he came down to help us out this week because he's run this mobile line before because my crew's busy disgorging labeling, which Mark saw, and bottling to Tourage. And so that production's like 3,500 cases a day with our yeah. sparkling lines. And so it's great to have that type of support, you know, big precept family uh, to, to help each other out when we need to get wine um, to the market. So, yeah, yeah you got to meet Hugo. So yeah. That's cool. Hugo said he would do an interview, but he charges a lot of money. Yeah. And, like, you know, really expensive. I'm a shoestring budget on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, so, so we got to see that, and that was really cool. And because um, uh, I, because I, I was mentioning to Michael that the last time I saw a mobile bottom line, and I'm, I'm almost positive, and this was at Petronalis, 
and uh, it was just one of my visits. I go, you know, I, I visit them usually one, two, three times a year. Um, and I happen to show up during the mobile bottling, but they're in between production runs, so I didn't get to see the actual the the equipment actually operate. So in 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 you know real life, so I got to see that. That was cool. So let's kind of walk through. Um, Let's kind of walk through the, the the process of how you make a sparkling wine, and you know you keep mentioning traditional methods. So we're going to touch upon what right. makes a traditional method a traditional method. So yeah. um, you know, let's talk about. I guess we'll start when the grapes come into the winery. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a great place to start. Yeah. Um, uh, so our harvest begins. Uh, I think our earliest harvest was July. Uh, 17 July. Okay. Um, so the parameters we're looking at when we pick uh, fruit for, for sparkling wine production is between 16 to 19 bricks. Okay. Um, so very low sugar because um, our, our winemakers are looking for that um, really bright acidity, um, not a lot, not a lot of sugar structure. Um, so we get the grapes in, and mm -hmm. Mark saw our presses. We have we have three different presses. We have two eight-ton capacity bladder presses, and we have one ten-ton capacity hydraulic press from Champagne. It's a, called a Cocard press, and um, that one's really cool. Uh, I think it's Laurent's favorite press. Yeah. Um, probably because it's French. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it um, uses a hydraulic piston that slowly moves a, moves a vertical wall. And when we're dumping the fruit in from the top in macro bins, mm -hmm. uh, and each macro bin can hold between 700 to 1,000 pounds of grapes. Okay. Um, we are we are doing a really slow press cycle, somewhere between four to six hours. Um, it depends on the volume of fruit, of course. Um, but uh, um, and Laurent, the winemaker, cellar team here wants that really slow press because we don't want a lot of the skin contact. We want we want the juice. Um, so. And that and those there's there's fractions of a total press load, and then there's different. Uh, phases of the press cycle. So the first press cycle is called cuvee um, in French, and that's the, the first run, if you will. That first press is usually 80% of the entire press load. Um, and I think cuvee is what we use for any of our Gouet core wines. Mm -hmm. Gouet Brut, Gouet Blanc de Noir, Gouet Rosé, uh, everything you've lived to grow and love uh, yeah. over the last 30 years. Uh, the best juice, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, second press is called uh, Thai, um, and we um, also very good uh, juice um, that we use for um, our Domain St. Vincent brands. Mm -hmm. We're actually, well, we'll have to go downstairs because we're gonna, we're just scorching labeling that yeah. now, so you'll get to see that production side since the guys were on lunch break. But uh, um, then at that point, you have your juice, it's split off. We, we press by varietal, so we'll press either all Chardonnay or we'll press all Pinot Noir. Uh, it goes into the pressing and settling tanks for 12 to 24 hours to let any type of sediment drop to the bottom. Mm -hmm. We rack off um, Cuvée Chardonnay, Cuvée Pinot Noir, Thai, which is our, that second press, usually a mixture of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. um, into 6,000 gallon or 12,000 gallon tanks. They're usually filled to about 80, 85% because we're gonna start the first fermentation at that point. Okay. So we add a lot of sugar, mm -hmm. we chaptalize, uh, we'll add sugar, we'll add yeast, we'll add some healthy enzymes. Um, we'll start the fermentation process, go up to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit for two to three weeks. Uh, get a nice clean fermentation, and then that's where you have your base cuvee Chardonnay yeah. or your base cuvee Pinot Noir. Um, and then uh, the next part of the process is well, before you get that part, sure. I got to yeah. see something really cool. Uh, I got to see oh, yeah. the yeast being made. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I've never seen that part of production. Yeah. So I got to see a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. In this in this trip, I mean. Besides the fact that, you know, in my head, I'm like, you're really crazy to drive out here <laughs> for one winery. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I in my head, I'm like, it's going to be worth it yeah. because, you know, I, I'm probably going to see some cool stuff and it, it's been worth it. So anyway, yeah. I got to see I got to see Laurent making babies. Yeah, got to see <laughs> Laurent making babies. This is, this is all PG, <laughs> I promise. All, yeah. uh, but we'll let's save that before right for the bottling to Toronto. OK, yeah, yeah, because that's yeah, that's because that. that's OK. Um, that's part of going into the bottling to tirage. Okay. Uh, so we we had our first fermentation, and that's 
for all the viewers. Um, uh, we do uh, sparkling wine, method champenoise. It's also called traditional method. Mm -hmm. And all that means really is that the first fermentation happens in the tank or barrel, and the second fermentation happens in the bottle. Um, and so uh, after that first fermentation, uh, the blending process occurs. Uh, and for me, it's like an art form. And thankfully, we have some really talented winemakers, Laurent and his nephew, Sofian, um, mm -hmm. and our cellar team, James and Jeremy, uh, because the blending process for me is what has made Gouray Gouray over the last 30 years, because there's that consistency of if you've had the Brut non-vintage this year, it should probably tastes pretty close like it did 10 years ago. Right. And to have not only that consistency from a flavor profile, but to have um, the value and the price point um, yeah. is, is pretty cool for traditional method sparkling wine, because I can tell you there are a lot of costs involved, and we put a lot of work into it uh, to, to make it really, really special um, at a great price. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm amazed because you know I, I know what this retails for, um, and I'm amazed at just because of the labor intensive stuff that's going on mm. that you're still able to deliver a value. Right. Um, you know, you know, I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the, 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 the winery only stuff costs. I haven't, I didn't look at those prices, but I know sure. the stuff that I see that gets out of the state. Right. Um, even whether it's a retail or even restaurant pricing, right. you know, you're like, wow, like this is like outstanding outstanding you know wine and you're delivering a really good value for it yeah we yeah. we uh and i'm not asking thing. you to give me the numbers i just yeah. i just want to make that point that yeah. you know there, there are some other pretty amazing sparkling wines out there and you guys are delivering it at a really great price that that's that's all i wanted to do. <laughs> yeah no thank you for that yeah. and and it it makes me feel great because i i get to travel every now and then obviously you get to go to champagne to look at equipment we're upgrading mm -hmm. our our machines and um you know, champagne is its own category, right? right. But you know, I, I definitely put up some of our our sparkling wines against against wines from Champagne, and mm -hmm. uh, definitely against Cava's, and and it's really fun fun to compare because there is really an unbelievable value, and right. um, and we put a lot of hard work into it, and it's the cellar, it's production, it's it's everyone that's part of this really really great team. Right. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so blending is is key, and uh, now at the volumes that we're doing, um, we've been uh, thanks to to precept and and resources, we've been able to add tank capacity. We've almost doubled our tank capacity um, to allow us uh, to create a better blend. Mm -hmm. You know, because that means that we can uh, so. So to give you an example of our blend for Grey Brut, it's usually 75% Cuvée Chardonnay, 25% Cuvée Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. uh, having more tanks allows our winemakers to um, to create that consistent blend, um, and uh, uh, it's really cool to see when they when they do the blend. Um, so after we've had like let's say a, a brute blend, mm -hmm. um, we need to uh, cold stabilize it. And we talked about that. Yeah, uh, it'll go through two filtrations after cold stabilization. Yeah, it'll, so I got to see the, I got to see both of them. But yeah, go, yeah. go describe those real yeah, quick. Yeah, so we use um, a machine called D filter. Basically, uses diatomaceous earth and it cleans out any of the uh, tartrates that may have dropped out during the cold stabilization process. Mm -hmm. um, so it goes from being cloudy to being pretty pretty clean and clear, but we want to make sure that the wine is um, as clean as possible before we bottle to tarage, before we dirty it up again with yeast and yeah, sugar. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and so we do another patent filter uh, uh, filtration, and you got to see that as well. Yeah, I got to see that. And, yeah, and, and the whole purpose of all this is that um, with the cold stabilization, in case you're not familiar with why it's being done, is, it, is to ensure that you don't see those little things known as wine diamonds or those little crystals um, because that's, and, and basically every white wine goes through this, so just so you know. Um, and, if, and if something didn't quite go right on the cold stabilization, yes, when you put in the refrigerator, which is what everybody does, you know, that's when you get these little ice, the little tart not ice, tartrate crystals, and that's just natural. It's it's, tart it's a tartaric acid. It's a normal thing. It's not going to hurt you. You can drink it. It just doesn't, it's like it's like getting the the, the same thing the, or the sediment from the from the tannins precipitating out in red wine. It's just not pleasant to drink. 
you know, that's it. Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> right. No, he's exactly right. And since obviously sparkling wines traditionally served cold, yeah. um, which it should be, we just definitely want to make sure that those don't form in our bottle. Yeah, it's really for yeah. aesthetics. Exactly. Yeah. And so so after filtration, we're ready to bottle to tirage. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool because Mark got to see um, some of the, it's like a starter, right? Starter yeast. So got to see the starter yeast. Um, Ron likes to say it's making babies because you're making those healthy yeast cells that we're going to introduce into the into the base wine for that second fermentation in the bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, so you all know usually a mix of how it started is uh, the base cuvee wine or the base blend uh, along with some water, some yeast, uh, something called phosphate tea tray, mm -hmm. um, and some sugar obviously, uh, to start that process. We heat it up, and he, so he got to see the three hectoliter. So yeah. there's good my metric system, right? 300 liters. 300 liters I don't yeah. know gallons because I've been here for eight years, <laughs> so it's like been metric because our winemaker's French. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's also kind of an interesting standard. Like, even when we talk, like, right. as, as psalms and all that, like... We, we like if I get asked how big is a Bordeaux barrel, I don't get I don't have to know the gallons. True. Two hundred twenty-five liters. What's yeah. the Burgundy barrel? Two twenty-seven. What you know? What's a what's a punch in five hundred liters? You know. Yeah. So we it, we, I mean, but then again, like we don't uh, when you talk in yields. Sometimes we get normal like imperial whatever u.s yields but then right. in europe they're doing hectoliters per hectare and like what but well, we don't use hectares here we use acres right so yeah. it is a, it's a mixture and you got to go back and forth and yeah you know I, I i use my little converter on the on the phone like what's that again no i use <laughs> i have an app to mark that i use because i was in champagne uh a month ago and had a great time there and um looking at these uh faster machines that we need to to build out to and yeah. uh um seeing some of the vineyards and some of the some of our hosts are obviously French and they're saying, Oh, how many how how big is this vineyard? This hectare is and I'm like, this yield and I'm like same yeah. thing. I'm like having to go to my phone and be like, How many tons per acre is that? Now? Yeah. So. Yeah, because we go tons per acre where they go hectoliters per hectare. <laughs> and it's like it's and I just kinda of just smile and nod. And I just kind of just kind of understand I don't know it. I can't do it in my head, but I kind of know what their standards are and what's right. normal for them. Right. And I just kind of go, that's 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 what they do over there, yeah. you know. And then I then I then I just know what's kind of normal and standard for here. Sure. And I just to me, it's just like it's like also when you're driving over there, you know, or you have to get kilometers per <laughs> the hour. Speed limit. You just kind of know that. Well, that's about eighty miles per hour here, you know, or seventy. And yeah. and then when I have when I have people coming over here, give me like you know how. How, how many how many feet they're they're you know how they're out to their vineyards right you know i just have, okay, what's that translation you know into feet exactly you know, that type of stuff speaking of that um so i passed over those mountains and that goes pretty high but what's right. do you know off top off top of your head the elevation for albuquerque sure our elevation here in albuquerque is five thousand feet okay and then uh santa fe is about a thousand feet more so over six thousand yeah. feet so on the drive here i got up to about because i kept asking the phone um, I won't mention the phone's name because I don't want I don't want the phone to do anything. Um, but I kept asking, you know, what's the altitude here? And it, I got up to I think I think it was around almost seven thousand. Not even those before yeah. hitting those mountains. Yeah. And it's like you know just a slow increase, kind of like in Texas, but you know, it, it's still high. And and I was telling um, I can't remember who, I think it was I can't remember one of the guys in Texas. I was t saying that I kind of noticed if I didn't even ask how high it was, you could tell because the clouds look lower. Yeah. I think, I can't, I guess I'm not a weatherman. I'm not a meteorologist, no, but I'm assuming true. that clouds have just a, versus sea level, just kind of have this, the atmosphere just has this like clouds form at a certain level. And it doesn't matter where, where the ground is. They just form at that level. And it's just like the clouds look like 3000 feet closer right. or four or five. I and mean, it's, it's kind of amazing if you've never like, especially in a day kind of do that. So anyway, let's move on. Um, so we do, so we, we, we made the starter use and all that, and so then we go into the next step. Yes, so the next step is called bottling to tirage. So mm -hmm. what we'll do at that point, uh, the winemakers, uh, the day before, uh, will add that, that mixture, if you will, of yeast and sugar, um, in addition to some riddling agents, which will help turn the wine, which I'll talk about next, um, uh, the day before. Uh, and basically, we have 
24 hours ish uh, to make sure that that wine uh, goes into the bottle. So the yeast starts eating the sugar and fermenting in the bottle and not in the tank. Yeah. Then we have problems. So um, we have an awesome master mechanic. His name is Larry. I'll give him a shout out. Yeah. Uh, He's been with us almost 12 years, and he can work on every line. So he's our saving grace, and we're really fortunate to have him on our team. He makes sure our machines are running. Um, Mark got to see our, our bottling to tirage mm -hmm. team, led by Gerardo Casas, our supervisor. And um, we can do, uh, if one line's running, we could do 30,000 bottles a day or 6,000 gallons or 2,500 cases. Um, we can, I could do that in, in metric if you'd like as well. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then um, uh, if we're running both bottling to tirage lines, uh, we can run double that. So 60,000 bottles, 5,000 cases, 12,000 gallons. Yeah. Um, so that is a lot of wine uh, and we don't store it all here. Uh, we actually send it to an offsite warehouse uh, where I have about 47,000 square feet of room that's getting less and less room and more and more wine. Yeah. So we have about 3.7 million bottles there now. And we are still trying to clean out the 18 harvest wine from our tanks because 2019 harvest is only two months away because yeah. we pick so early for the high acidity. So it's really crunch time. So guys are kind of stressed out, but we'll... We always seem to make it happen here at Grue, and yeah. we, we will again. Um, so in the uh, bottling to tirage process, you're obviously, it's, it's like a filling machine for bottling. The wine's put in a bottle. The next section, we apply the bedule. It's a plastic insert to keep out the oxygen. Uh, third section is we apply a crown capsule. Looks like a bottle cap. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we lay the wine down in containers. You saw the folding wire mm -hmm. cages. Yeah. We send it off to offsite warehouse. Uh, anything that's uh, best in for Gruet Core, Gruet Brut, Gruet Rose sits out there a minimum of 15 months aging. The second fermentation in the bottle, so everyone knows, usually is done between four to six weeks. Okay. Um, and then after that point, uh, we actually have a great quality assurance specialist. Her name's Carrie Grude, and she will use a tool called an ephrometer. Oh, okay. And it will, we can uh, inject that. Uh, it's almost like a Corvin. Or okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and what it'll do is it'll measure the pressure and basically make sure that we have a spark, that we have bubbles. Yeah. And so we do that on all of our lots because we take QC very seriously. Um, and it's part of the process, right, to make sure that we have the best sparkling wine and that you're going to get your bubbles. Yeah. Um, so at that point, we have to transfer the wine into um, giro pallets or cages so we can bring the wine back to Gray, our main production facility where all of our giro pallets are. Uh, Mark saw it. We could turn 4,000 cases of wine at a time. Yeah. And uh, it's quite the process. Um, Gerardo Casas is also our um, riddling supervisor. Uh, and we're watching the wine every day, the winemakers, production, operations, um, because we have to make sure the wine turns successfully or else it can get cloudy and that's not good. Right, yeah. Um, so You guys show me, you pulled one of the bottles out, you got, you got to see the, the lees, like, you know, starting to settle on that shoulder. You know, that was really good. Right. Um, and then, uh, so you get those done, it takes about anywhere from three to seven days, depending on the wine, right? Right. To get that finished. Exactly. And then what happens after that? Okay. All right, so we had to take a break real quick. Uh, Michael's got a tour that's actually here right now, so we're going to try to finish this up really quick. All right, so pick up where you left off. <laughs> uh, so um, the riddling process, um, uh, basically, like um, Mark was saying, it's uh, for Chardonnay-based wines, like our Brut, majority of it's Chard, uh, or Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay. The riddling programs take three, max five days. Pinot Noir-based wines take a little bit longer. Uh, five to seven days, um, but it's um, basically the main, I don't want to say challenge, but uh, the point in the production of sparkling wine that's so critical um, because the wine has to turn clean. Because um, if it doesn't, we can't get successfully through disgorging and labeling. Yeah. Um, so one of the f cool French words, see some cool with your friends, is when the wine's been uh, 
turned or riddled successfully, it's called surpoint because the neck's uh, facing down. Um, so the next part is we got to get that dead yeast or lees out of there, yeah. right? Um, so that process is called the scourging labeling. Um, we bring up the cages next to our ice machine, also called a neck freezer. Um, it's a liquid solution uh, that we put the bottles and neck down uh, and it basically flash freezes the neck of the bottle and captures that dead yeast in an ice cube. Okay. It's pretty cool. It goes to negative 30 degrees Celsius. It's a mixture of water um, and uh, glycol. Um, then we have a robotic arm that flips it right side up and it just looks like an ice cube. Um, and we'll definitely have to take a video of that yeah, so, so you can see that, that, yeah. that process. I'll, I'll hook you up with Sergio, my okay. disgorging labeling lead, and it'd be good for him to explain that process. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, we run through there, uh, and the first section's called the scourging. It basically takes off uh, like a stainless steel thumb almost that takes off that, that bottle cap, that crown capsule, and shoots out the dead yeast or lees because the pressure inside the bottle is between 60 to 80 pounds per square inch mm -hmm. or five to seven bar. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> right. um, uh, and then basically uh, uh, the next step was called dosage. So once we, um, uh, once we remove th that dead yeast, uh, the wine at that point, the base cuvee or base tie is bone dry, right? Mm -hmm. So for our different style of wines we have some wines that are more sweet so our sweetest sparkling wine uh for gruet is our demi sec yeah so and you remember off the top head what the what the grams per liter on that is i think it's 25 grams per liter for our demi sec it's okay. our sweetest and then for like our brute blend it's eight grams per liter yeah because yeah. i had the demi sec and it really isn't that sweet i mean it's, yeah. it, it's sweeter than brute obviously right. And and uh, Brittany kind of likened it kind of to prosecco as far as like yeah. a sweetness level, right. and I think that's good. So um, I was expecting something a lot sweeter, right. and it wasn't, and it's it's really nice. So if you're afraid, you're like, oh, it's gonna be sweet, it's not. You should try it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a great point, um, and you know, dosage is key. Um, and that's part of the consistency as well. Yeah. You know, our winemakers are always. Uh, tasting because it's critical to taste because you know each of the lots that we're bottling to tirage it's wine's a living organism mm -hmm. right so you want to make sure that sometimes you may have to adjust the dosage maybe if the wine's been on tirage for a longer period of time mm -hmm. um, to keep that to keep that consistency um, then we uh, apply a cork we apply a wire hood uh, we agitate the wine, our shaker right. mixer, uh, because when you introduce the dosage, it's different specific gravity. So you want to make sure that your dosage is mixed in with the base wine, mm -hmm. the base sparkling. Um, we have a washer and dryer because some of our reserve wines have been aging for five, six years. Um, they're kind of dusty. Yeah. Uh, so you want to get those cleaned up. You want to dry the bottle so the label stick. Uh, we apply uh, foil or capsule. I've heard it called both. Yeah. And then we apply the labels, and then we put it in a 12-bottle case uh, carton, and it's shipped around to all 50 states. And we also export some to Japan and Canada, yeah. I think. And uh, um, it's been a real, for me, a, personally, a really amazing experience. Um, I was telling Mark that... Uh, having been the director of operations here, I've been able to grow Gruet sparkling wine production, a million bottles uh, from 2014. So yeah. a million bottles, doubled our growth in five years. That's amazing. And uh, it's been a challenge. It hasn't been easy, but it's all due to the amazing team that we, we have. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, a couple things, you know, why I do this is because I, I will I learn things that you don't get out of a book and a couple of things about this process is I don't remember the name of it now but the the thing you put on before you put the crown cap the bedul the bedul yeah you didn't know that existed yeah. and that's normal that's what happens yeah. um, didn't realize that the bottle gets shaken after you do the dosage either because it makes sense right you know in in the books they just go they add dosage and then, then that's it right you know you did so these are things that you learn. Because, you know, a book doesn't tell you everything, you know, so right. I visit because this is how I learn stuff. So, yeah. you know, Michael, it's been 
amazing experience. Well, thank you. you. Know, it, it's it, been it exceeded fun. exceeded all expectations. <laughs> I figured I was going to learn cool. some cool stuff and taste some cool wine, right. and which I did, but it right. kind of exceeded expectations, especially because I got to see some stuff that I just happened to show up on the right day. Right. So um, we're going to finish this up. Uh, cool. Thank you so much for thank spending you. a lot of time with yeah, me. Yeah, I really uh, enjoyed it. Thank you. I enjoyed yeah. it too. I know you got to get going. I'm going to sign off here. All right, folks, that's going to do it. You can click the links above to friend me up. I'll have links below uh, for Gouet, so you check it out. Um, and we'll see everyone again next time. Bye.